Well, it's a real a joy and privilege, a privilege to um, be able to be with you this morning. I'm so grateful for the invitation. It's great to see Presbyterians out on a Saturday morning in the rain. Uh, that's <laughs> impressive to me. Um, those of us up at Princeton uh, Theological Seminary um, are really inspired by what you are doing here in the Presbytery of Philadelphia. We have so many of our students uh, who graduated and come down here and serve as pastors and in other leadership roles and have such faithful ministries. Uh, when so many Presbyterians are, you know, seem to be just struggling to get their ducks in a row or they're in survival mode, we see all kinds of leadership emanating from this Presbytery. Uh, and this is a special room to me. I, there are people in this room right now that I went to school with, that I taught when I was on the faculty, uh, that I worked with as colleagues, uh, uh, and, and Ruth, uh, of course, uh, I worked for, uh, in a manner of speaking. Uh, she's on our board. Uh, she has a really important uh, leadership role on our board, and I'm, I'm really grateful for her leadership, and I respect her as a leader. Uh, but I'm also really glad to say that she's become a trusted friend. and um, She speaks into my life and lets me sometimes speak into her life, and that's a tremendous gift to me. And this leadership team that you have down here, Greg and Kevin and uh, Ruth, uh, it just really is encouraging. And so when I'm out on the road, and this is, this is true, I'm not just saying this because I'm here and Martin making you feel good. Um, when people are discouraged about the church, about the PCUSA, I talk about this presbytery. Um, and the great leaders, and the innovative projects, the, the, uh, the ministry incubators, one we're real excited about at the seminary, so our students get to benefit from that. So thank you for the faithful way that you are living out your, your calling in this uh, city and region. Ruth asked me to talk about some aspect of the changing needs of leadership in a changing church. We all know it's a tumultuous and unsettling kind of time. Um, and rather than talk to you about strategies or techniques for ministry, if you ever want me to come down and talk about that, I will come, but I will bring some folks from our seminary who are really well positioned to talk to you about that. Uh, when, when things get tough for the church, I tend to turn to the New Testament. I was trained uh, in the New Testament, and the reason I gravitated toward the study of the New Testament is that it just sort of captivated my life and directed it um, as a young person, and I, I live out of it. And so when I'm puzzled, when I'm discouraged, um, that's where I go. So it has been uh, uh, fairly common to open up a newspaper or uh, listen to a news broadcast and hear people worry that we've lost in this country a sense of a common good. This idea that we should all uh, sacrifice and work for the, the greater good for everybody. But people seem to have retreated into their own agendas and, and, and groups uh, uh, and have a hard time getting out of those and seeing beyond those. And so we're polarized and we're fragmented and we see the bad fruits of this every day. So that is indeed discouraging and worrisome. Uh, but also, for those of us who uh, have devoted our lives to Jesus Christ, uh, a time of great opportunity. This is when the world, this is when the society, this is when our communities need what we have to offer more than ever. And so because of this discourse about the disappearance of the common good from uh, life in the United States these days, I've been thinking a lot about the common good and what a Christian account of the common good looks like. Because that phrase doesn't occur in the New Testament. But I want to submit to you, uh, and you won't be surprised by this, that the concept of the common good is there. And I think it's related to our language of the kingdom of God. So we could do a whole series on this. We could talk about this for a year. But this morning, in the brief time that we have, I just want us to dip into the Beatitudes to get a sense of this. So I want us to look at the Beatitudes and think about uh, this idea called the common good, uh, our language for it, the kingdom of God. And then to think about how that relates to congregational life and congregational leadership. So without further ado, I want us to dive into the, the text that we have before us. So I printed out here the Beatitudes from the New Revised Standard Version. I've made a change, uh, and then I've, I've got a, a word in italics at the end of each of those Beatitudes, and I want to draw your attention to those. The Beatitudes are really important. In the Gospel of Matthew, 
They uh, are the first public words that Jesus says. Matthew spends four chapters setting up uh, his narrative of Jesus' life. So you have the, in, the, uh, the infancy narratives. You've got all the stuff about John the Baptist, Jesus being baptized and tempted in the wilderness. And now here in 5, the beginning of what we know as the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus utters his first public words that Matthew gives us. And they're these, these striking beatitudes. One of the challenges for reading the Bible is that in passages like this, we can get so familiar um, with the words, those, those comforting, rhythmic words, that they don't grip us, they don't grab us um, like we need them to sometimes. And so as a New Testament scholar, I like to mess around with translation. Translation is one way you can begin to uh, help us slow down and encounter something new, um, in, uh, something familiar in a new way. So uh, let's see if we can take a few minutes and, and, and get some new eyes for the Beatitudes. Uh, the first thing I have to say is that the Beatitudes have been read and interpreted lots of different ways in the history of the Christian tradition, tradition all the way back to the ancient church. Um, so there are different ways of organizing them, understanding who they relate to and who they speak to, uh, and that's rich and good um, and something to be celebrated in the, the church's reading of the Bible. So my way of looking at these this morning is not to say any other way of reading them is excluded, but simply to say, rather, I find this way fruitful and it uh, resonates with what I believe the gospel writer wants to say about the kingdom of God. So Jesus comes out onto this Galilean hillside and all these people have gathered, and he says to them, happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Happy are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now you notice I've translated, I've substituted for the word blessed, which is more to be expected. Blessed are those uh, who are poor in spirit and so forth. The word happy. And the reason for that is to show a resonance with some Old Testament texts that gets obscured if we translate this word in Greek, blessed. Blessed are those, blessed are those. The New Testament speaks of blessing all the time. That word in Greek occurs all over the New Testament, but it does not occur here in the Beatitudes. Rather, the word that occurs here is more like happiness, but not superficial happiness, like deep contentedness. Deeply contented are those who are poor in spirit. Now, those who are listening to Jesus would surely have said, wait, 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 wait. This preacher is, is odd. Because when one says in the Jewish tradition, happy are those, the expectation is that it would be something like we see in Psalm 1, printed near the bottom of your page. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and so forth. Or like Proverbs, happy are those who make the Lord their trust. Who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. Uh, or happy are those who find wisdom and those who get understanding. So deeply contented are those who obey God's law. That's the idea in the Psalms and the wisdom literature. That if I follow the way of life that the Creator designed, that's how I will flourish and be fruitful in the world. Um, and if I depart from that path, um, then my flourishing is compromised and called into question. So I'm contented. I'm living as I'm supposed to live, as God designed me to live, if I'm obedient to what God has said. Even in the Old Testament, this kind of neat correlation between my obedience and my flourishing starts to get called into question. But here, in the words of Jesus, uh, this is outright subverted. So when Jesus is saying, happy are those, deeply contented are those, and then goes on to describe people who are in dire straits, you know that Jesus is up to something quite interesting. And what I think Jesus is up to here is suggesting that those who uh, find themselves in dire straits um, are not there because of some kind of uh, act or fault of their own. So that those of who are poor in spirit, for instance, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, says Jesus. 
So Jesus is describing a new kind of kingdom. And it's not like the kingdom that his hearers would have known. Uh, the earthly kingdoms um, uh, in which power and privilege and connection makes you a, a leading citizen. And he's even redefining this Jewish idea of the kingdom, right, which uh, uh, the fo his followers hoped would be put into place with a military conquest driving out the Romans, and God is calling a king like David over the people again. Jesus has an entirely different kind of kingdom in mind, and here, on this hill, is when he starts teaching people what that kingdom will be like. Notice says Jesus, happy are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom is for people like this. In a normal kingdom, these kinds of people would not be valued, but in God's kingdom they are. Matthew sometimes gets beat up a little bit for adding in spirit to poor here, spiritualizing uh, the beatitude so it no longer refers to poverty. Luke says, uh, when he records Jesus saying this, blessed are the poor, Matthew says, blessed are the poor in the spirit. So I want to submit to you that my own studies suggest to me that Matthew has gotten a bit of a bad rap here. Uh, that the language of being poor in spirit in uh, ancient Jewish texts uh, actually takes uh, into account the socioeconomic condition um, of poverty, but goes beyond it to the existential dimension of being in that state. So that if I'm poor in spirit, it means that I don't have resources. I am in poverty, and I am despairing in that state in which I cannot help myself. So I like to think about this as people who are helpless. I think that's a good way to, to uh, in a modern idiom, to think about the kind of people Jesus is pointing to. Happy are those who are helpless. Why are they happy? Why? Because God is paying attention to them, and they are valued, and they have worth and dignity. Happy are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Uh, certainly in view here, any single person who might be in a state of uh, mourning. But when the language of mourning is used in the Jewish tradition, it tends more to point to corporate mourning. A nation or a people that is in mourning because of some terrible thing that has happened. A uh, famine, uh, subjugation to a foreign uh, empire or something like that. So mourning is this state of being in discouragement, uh, feeling hopeless. So happy are those who are discouraged, for they will be comforted in God's kingdom that is coming. Happy are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And uh, the, the word in Greek um, that's translated meek here, phaus, um, can mean sort of like one who is humble, doesn't call attention to oneself. Um, but it's not the way that it's usually used. This word is usually uh, uh, made distinct um, from strength or might. It's the contrast of that, to be strong, to be mighty. The opposite of that is to be meek, to not have power. Jesus himself, twice in Matthew, describes himself as meek. And so when Jesus says that, he's not saying that he's kind of shy and retiring. We know that's not true. He can bring the prophetic fire. He's not meek that way. But he's meek in terms of power, in the sense that he doesn't go the way of military martial might, but rather uh, another path, nonviolent, meek, without power. So I think the way that we might think about this verse uh, is to think of powerlessness. Happy are those who are powerless, for they will inherit the earth. It's usually armies that inherit lands, right? Um, no, in God's kingdom, those that are powerless will find themselves in uh, uh, privileged positions. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Here's another place we have to make an interpretation. To hunger and thirst for righteousness sometimes can mean those who are zealous, uh, want to lead an upright life. And that's certainly a way to read this. I read it another way, um, which has precedent in the Jewish tradition, and that is that those who hunger and thirst lack something. If I'm thirsty, I need water. I don't have it. If I'm hungry, I lack food. I need it. So those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, I think, means those who lack uh, justice. Those who, have, uh, who's, who are desperate for righteousness because they've been deprived of it. They are victims of injustice. So happy are those who have been victims of injustice 
uh, for they will be filled. They will find that justice in God's kingdom. So happy are those who are helpless, discouraged, powerless, and victims of injustice, says Jesus, because God has a plan for them. God has them in view. God cares for them. God regards them as uh, 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 bearing dignity and worth because they are made in God's image. So how are these folks going to be uh, uh, have an experience of that kingdom of God where they are valued? Well, now we see a turn in the Beatitudes. Now we're not talking about dire straits. We're talking about people possessing certain characters or virtues. Happy are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And mercy here again can mean um, uh, to extend grace when someone has wronged me. Um, but I think it's uh, the, the larger view here is uh, compassion, acts of mercy. Uh, and compassion and graciousness. Happy are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Purity in heart here is the same language in the Old Testament we find with respect to cleanness of heart. Create me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Purity or cleanness of heart has to do, when you read the Old Testament, with having a right will, having my, my will and my desires and my intentions lined up um, to the best of my ability with God's purposes, and then my outward actions match that. There's an alignment between the inward person and outward actions. And in my experience, we call people who have this quality of alignment, inner and outer, people of integrity. They're integrated persons. Their, their inner will and outer actions line up. So happy are those uh, who have integrity, for they will see God. Happy are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Uh, peacemakers is a, is a fine translation here, but I don't think it, gets, it doesn't make us think about a robust enough idea. Um, peace, right? In the Jewish tradition, shalom. Any of you know that shalom is a really big, holistic concept, has to do with uh, being right with God and right with my neighbors. I'm in a state of shalom. My relationships are well-ordered and they're just. Uh, and I'm living as God intended. I'm, ex I'm experiencing shalom. So when Jesus says, blessed are those shalom makers, he's talking about more than simply the, those who help violence to cease. That's not a bad thing, but there's more at stake here. Those who create shalom right, are those who create the conditions of hu for human flourishing. Happy are those who create the conditions for human flourishing. That's what a peacemaker is. Happy are those who create the conditions for human flourishing, for they will be called children of God. Happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And people who keep on going uh, with their principles, with their beliefs, no matter what the cost, we say that those folks have the courage of their conviction. Happy are those who have the courage of their conviction, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And happy are those when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you. Again, uh, we can see here that uh, holding true to one's principles and beliefs requires courage. People who stand fast even when there's danger are people of courage. So I submit to you that what Jesus is suggesting in the Beatitudes, his first public words in the Gospel of Matthew, is that in God's kingdom, which is coming in Jesus' own person and ministry, he's inaugurating it, he's bringing it, that in this kingdom, there are some ways of thinking and being that are different from any other kingdoms that his hearers would have known. And we actually know that many folks never get this idea, and they see in Jesus a threat, and they will kill him. Uh, but Jesus' notion of the kingdom of heaven is that there are those in the world who are, who are helpless, they're discouraged, they're powerless, and they are victims of injustice. And God loves them and wants them to experience God's just, loving, compassionate kingdom. And the way that that's going to happen is not that there's going to be a divine snap of the fingers or a waving of some kind of magic wand and those folks are going to go from being in a dire strait to being in a flourishing state. No. Those people will experience the kingdom because people who are compassionate, 
who have integrity, who want to fight for the conditions that lead to human flourishing, who have the courage of their conviction, and who are people of courage, will go and give those people an experience of God's kingdom. So God counts on us, those of us who put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, to go out into the world and to give those who are marginalized and oppressed and depressed and lonely an experience of God's gracious, loving kingdom. God wants that for every single human person, indeed for the entire creation. And God partners with us, those who have been called into the church to make that happen. So what does that mean? A couple of takeaways. We could talk about this all day, but I want to give a couple of takeaways and then we can do some, some back and forth. For me, this means that there is no meaningful or coherent way to make a distinction between my personal faith and piety and something like social justice. Uh, we've gotten pretty good in the Protestant church in dividing these things so that uh, conservative churches focus on personal piety and so forth and progressive churches focus on social justice. The writers of the New Testament would have had no idea what that kind of distinction or division meant or was trying to accomplish. The only vision in the New Testament is that people who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ are equipped to go out into the world and give people an experience of God's gracious kingdom. Uh, there is no distinction between my belief and my piety and what I'm called to do in the world. Those are a seamless, those are integrated uh, uh, phenomena. And related to that, the second point, this gives us the proper conceptuality of a congregation. And I know that many of you know this, but it's, uh, it's worth driving home in the kind of age we find ourselves in. On this account of the kingdom of God and how people experience God's kingdom, a congregation is nothing other than the place where we are, we are drawn together and equipped to go out into the world and give people an experience of God's kingdom. That's what a congregation is. It's an equipping station. Now, sometimes when you say that, people get nervous because it, it might suggest that all the stuff that we know as church and all the stuff that's really meaningful to us in the congregation somehow, that isn't important or that doesn't matter. And that's not the case at all. Because you have to ask the question, how are we shaped as disciples of Jesus? How does God get us ready to go out there and bring people and experience the kingdom? Fellowship. Worship. Liturgy. Preaching. Sacraments. Christian education. Being part of a community that cares for me when I struggle. We all lean on one another so that we are able to go out and do the work in the world that God calls us to. So all the stuff that we know uh, in uh, congregational life is vital. That's what God uses to equip us. We get into trouble when we, when we put a full stop at the end of the congregation is gathered to, to be shaped by preaching and liturgy and worship and sacraments and fellowship and receiving pastoral care, full stop. That's what it's about. This place where I get all that. That's where the mistake comes in. We experience all of this rich life in congregations together so that we can be equipped to be sent out. In that sense, every congregation is apostolic. The, the, the word apostolic in Greek means one who is sent, to be sent out. And the New Testament only has a vision for church uh, in which the church is sent out into the world. And so it begins to shape your congregational sensibilities, and uh, it means you can't sort of carve out some part of congregational life and call it mission and say, we, we have some folks who work on the mission of the congregation, we support it financially, and they do some stuff. I mean, that's, that's all well and good, but you really get into this uh, mindset of the entire congregation being, being uh, called into existence for no other reason than to partner with God in giving people an experience of the kingdom. And you start wondering whether you need some more robust ways of understanding all of your life and programs together. So I'll end with this. If you will turn over the page, you'll see that I've included a, a, a verse from 2 Corinthians. So having uh, established that congregations are about being sent out into the world, we need to have a sophisticated account of divine and human agency. 
That's what I mean by that. So that you'll sometimes hear folks say, uh, you know, language of giving people an experience of the kingdom makes me nervous because it sounds like it's something that humans do. And so, the, uh, and so somehow this, this is uh, trying to accomplish what is God's to accomplish. And so we need to find that middle ground between a sort of completely passive notion that, right, as a Christian, what I do is I'm, I, I get baptized, I'm I, uh, part of a congregation, I receive the sacraments, uh, I don't commit great harm, harm in my life to people, and, and uh, that's what I do as a Christian. I was raised in a tradition like that, though. It was conservative Lutheran tradition in North Dakota. Very passive, very scared of works righteousness. On the other hand, you one can find... Um, uh, notions of giving people an experience of the kingdom that seem pretty theologically thin. And it sounds like a sort of social service uh, sort of enterprise. So, like in everything, the New Testament writers have a much more nuanced understanding than that. And we find it on display here in 2 Corinthians 5. Paul writes, From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making an, an appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. So this is a nice summary of an idea you find all over the New Testament. So that there is a mingling of divine and human agency. So God is at work in the world calling us to faith, equipping us in the congregation. And when we are sent out into the world, we do so in the power of the Holy Spirit. But there is some sense, meaningful sense, in which we... Each of us, as a human agent, is involved in that. And that's how the gospel works. That's why there's such urgency in Paul, by the way. Paul has the sense that we, for whatever divine reason, uh, we have been chosen to partner with God in giving people an experience of the kingdom. And that's what God desperately wants. He wants those who are generally on the margins of human societies and kingdoms to know and to experience the love of God that helps them to understand and to feel and to know and to live in the reality that, in fact, they are of absolute worth in God's eyes. So this is a divine human partnership. Uh, if, we, if we tilt too far one way or the other, the scriptures call us back to that understanding that it is uh, something that we are called and equipped and empowered by God to do. So there's no sense that we are trying to build our own kingdom and call it God's kingdom nor any sense that if we just sit back on our laurels and kind of let the world go by, that God somehow magically, mystically will bring people and experience in the kingdom. God counts on us for that. That can be really daunting, but it's also uh, humbling and a deep privilege. So, in my view, uh, congregational life, uh, congregation, are the center, the beating heart of Christian faith. And even though congregations can struggle... And Protestantism in North America sometimes seems like it's on the ropes. I have no doubt that God continues to have uh, a central, primary, fundamental role for congregations because God wants people to experience the loving, just, compassionate kingdom of God. And the folks in this room are the ones who are going to make that possibility a reality for people in the world. Thank you. Thank you. 
great question. So the, the rich young ruler from, from Matthew or Mark, actually, is the, from Mark is the, is the text for tomorrow. I think it's directly uh, uh, related to this. Um, that in that uh, episode, when Jesus makes such a seemingly a, a, a sharp request um, of this man that ultimately he cannot uh, um, uh, answer uh, in the way Jesus would like. Um, when I hear preachers preach on this text, I often hear them uh, uh, let, let the rich man off the hook uh, for not being willing to give up all of his possessions. And so they become very spiritualized, a uh, very spiritualized kind of encounter, and it's about the man's attachment to his wealth that is the problem somehow. And surely that is true, but there is a materiality to the kingdom uh, that Jesus described uh, in which it would be expected that that uh, interior attachment to goods is related to what one does with those goods. Uh, and so is it reasonable to ask people the question, right, if you have the resources that you uh, need in life, uh, uh, what constitutes human flourishing for you, and given your obligations uh, as a Christian to give other people an experience of flourishing, what does that mean about your material possession? So it, 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 we need to ask the hard question. We need to push people in this respect. The gospel can't be afraid to push uh, people um, um, to question uh, their values, their choices, and their priorities, because the kingdom of God re represents a reprioritizing um, relative to sort of normal human standards. So, if the uh, a lot of a lot of preachers tomorrow will say on that text, it's okay if you're wealthy; it's, it's how you feel about it, right? See, it's about whether you idolize it, uh, and that's a good word. But the, the message needs to be pushed uh, further. Um, in terms of the discipleship of people who have wealth, uh, in their walk with God and in their accountability to their community, um, uh, do they feel like they are being faithful, uh, given the resources they have and the mandate to uh, provide um, resources to those who don't have? Um, so again, it's uh, in history the tradition. You know, this you can read this in social. Marxist kind of way, and that kind of leads uh, people on the, into all kinds of de debates and disputes. But I would say generally, to stay out of that debate for a minute, um, to not spiritualize it and to push after the material dimensions of this. In other words, challenging people whether they need everything that they So, so the question is, is providing a, 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 a more um, tangible witness yeah. as we participate in activities in the community that have to do with the common good. Um, so I think, it, again, it's, it's um, Presbyterian Garden is notoriously shy in terms of talking about their uh, faith. Um, I, I think that it, it, um, it's more interesting to think about it at a, at first at a kind of congregational level rather than at an individual level. Um, do the people in your community understand you to be um, a group of people who is concerned first and foremost with the common good? That for me is the secular translation of giving people an experience of the kingdom of God. If I say, I feel called to, uh, to give every single person um, an experience of God's kingdom, which means flourishing and justice, uh, 
Um, that, may, that may not always translate to those outside the Christian family, but if we say, our faith leads us to be fierce advocates for the common good, um, and that if we aren't known for that in our community, then that's, then that's the issue. Um, so why, why is not the perception of our congregation that they are, that they are uh, these subversive cells of advocacy for the common good? Um, and you, you just, you wish that people would say, you know, those Christians in, in that congregation, they're interesting cats. They, uh, it's kind of hard to get them to um, 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 express complete loyalty to this or that political party where they agree with lots of the stuff that we agree with. But, and they have, they have their own agenda. Um, and it's very selfless. It's always for the other. And if somebody is struggling or in need, man, those Christians are just always showing up and advocating for those people and harassing those who, uh, who don't see this as a problem and won't help. And, and they, they are, they are, they are uh, altruistic and they're selfless. And I don't know about their kind of crazy beliefs, but I'm really glad they're in our community. I mean, I think that's what you want to be shooting for as a congregation. I talk to this about our seminarian all the time. So absolutely, we should all be better Expressing our faith in ways that aren't manipulative. That's a, that, like, that's a great thing for congregations to work on because our society has become skittish about Christian testimony because oftentimes they've been beat over the head with it and they, they just kind of turn and burn sort of stuff. And so if you start talking about your faith and your belief, you're like, no, no, no. Now this person's going to judge me, going to condemn me, going to um, uh, kind of track me into making. And so we need to we need to work on evangelism um, in a in a vein that's robust and not manipulative. But I know I think the more, the more interesting question is how is our congregation perceived in the community? Do people say I don't know 